inspire the uninspired and motivate people. You know, so this this is exactly that's my passion. All right. So if you find your passion, you will never work a day in your life. I guarantee you. You don't wake up to go to work. You wake up for your passion. You're able to get out of bed and say, I'm ready to go. Let's do this. Okay? You gotta live out your passion, and it starts with your values. You have to value whatever this is in your life and have it at your center, and that is your why. You gotta have a reason why you do what you do. If there's no reason for it, then you're not living out your passion, and you're literally committing spiritual suicide. sit here and I can tell you every single book to read. I can tell you every single seminar to go to. I can tell you every training to go to as a fire department. I can do every single thing I can to throw my hands in here and go, oh my gosh, leaders and this and that. But it doesn't matter until it becomes personal. Tell you right now, dream a big dream and follow it. Have the courage to follow it, and I guarantee you, people will follow you. St. Patrick's Day, 2007, my house burned down. Everybody I thought were my friends bailed out. Fire department was like two blocks away. Whole top of the house, gone. Melted down, all that stuff, gone. I had nobody. Everybody I thought were my friends, bailed on me. So I keep my circle close. And when I say close, I mean I know who I got because they got my back behind my back. That's who I keep next to me. And I'm telling you, when things get crazy, this Elevations team that you guys got, that's who's gonna have you back. Rely on each other. I can tell you all day long, oh, you gotta be like this as a leader, you gotta be like this, you gotta be like this. The greatest currency in the world is the effect that you have on people. How are we doing? Show of hands, who's happy to be here? Outstanding, all of you, outstanding. Uh, who's ever made big decisions in their life? Raise your hand. Outstanding. Who's not going to raise their hand no matter what I say? <laughs> outstanding. All three of you, got it. Perfect. I'm so happy to be here. I got a question for you. What is the hardest decision that you've ever had to make? Look in your heart. What's the hardest decision you've had to make? What about you guys? Is there a decision that you were faced with that tormented you even after you made it? There might be. I grew up like everybody else. I grew up in Detroit. I got pictures of my family. When I was a kid, that was me and the Detroit Lions stuff. Yeah, I'm a Detroit Lions fan. So we used to go to Detroit Zoo. What you don't see in this picture right here is that this is Thanksgiving when I was a kid. We learned to mask ourselves as children. What you don't see in that picture is the big bruise on the side of my mother's face because my stepdad punched her face in that early morning. I grew up in a broken home filled with drugs and alcohol and domestic violence. My dad left to go in the military and my mother said, you have an ultimatum. If you stay with me, we can make it work. If you leave, I'm done. He said, this is in my heart. I have to go in the military. This is in my heart. She said, okay, see you later, and gave him divorce papers. What you don't see in that picture of children is the sleepless nights and crying and police and alcohol that was prevalent and physical abuse for me and my two sisters. That's what you don't see. There's ways that we mask ourselves and there's ways that we deal with pain. I never wanted to deal with pain. But there are ways that we deal with it. We deal with it in three ways. 
we hit it head on. We say, I'm going to use the power of God, I'm going to use the power of my friends and family and everybody around me, and I'm going to deal with it, and I'm going to defeat these self-defeating behaviors. Or you can be like me, who masked their pain with alcohol, and that's what I did. By the time that I was 26, I was a functioning alcoholic. Growing up the way that I did, I learned that I can get by by just a smile and a handshake. I was very good at it. My two sisters and I were very good at smiling. Yes, we're good. And then going home and dealing with what we did. The problem with that is that we don't deal with what we're supposed to deal with. And so later on in life, things start creeping back in. For example, when I see young children and maybe I see a parent that is getting on them about something and I instantly flash back, I then run to a bottle of alcohol and drink my sorrows away. That's how I dealt with pain. The third way that people deal with pain is that they just ignore it and hope it goes away, which is just as bad as if you deal with it with alcohol because when you don't deal with it, things become worse. Like I said in the video, in 2007, my house burned down. I was at the lowest point that I thought I could be. I had a huge party St. Patrick's Day. My house burned down. Everybody who I thought were my friends bailed on me. They all left. Nobody was around except for one person who is now my wife who is here with me today. She calls me and says, what can I do? What can I help with? The entire fence, the side of the house. That's my neighbor's house in that bottom right picture. That's the neighbor's house. The other three pictures are of my house or what was left of my house. I don't think I'm going to get the deposit back on that house. So I'm, I'm left to deal with the aftermath. And what do you think I did? I drank a lot. And I drank myself into the depths, probably the lowest that I thought I could go. But my wife was helping me because she had me move in. She said, we'll take care of you, you know, all this other stuff. Perfect. Well, then we ended up getting married. I was like, yeah, this is awesome. It was like a blessing in disguise. You know, my house burned down. I can move in with her. Like, let's do this. Except I was not prepared at all for marriage to the point where she already had a young child from a previous engagement and I would get on him and instantly flash back to, ooh, my stepdad did that to me and I would drink and I would drink and I would drink to the point that she did not want anything to do with me. You're broken. I can't help you any more than I'm already helping you. So we split up. She couldn't deal with me anymore. I was literally drinking every day. I was drinking just to wake up. I wake up, drink a beer, and I go to work in the military to work on aircraft. I come home on lunch break to drink. I would start shaking halfway through work. I got to go home and go drink. I would drink all the way down to about maybe 10, 11 o'clock at night, then go to bed, then wake up and do it all again the next day. That was my life, and she couldn't take it anymore, so she left. I looked at it as, wow, I just literally turned into the person that I despised my entire life. I turned into the person that I said I would not become. So in 2008, in December, I got to the lowest, lowest point of my life. She is, like, done, divorce papers, she's moving out, she took the kids, gone, Christmas is my favorite time of the year. I Griswold my house. Oh, yeah. I won the uh, Christmas lighting contest last year. Thanks, babe. So, December 2008, I was at the lowest point that I could go. I was drinking. I was being foolish. I then showed up to work drunk. They were going to kick me out of the military. I'm losing my career. I just lost my family, and I have no idea where to turn to. So I did what I always did. I did what we are accustomed to. See, we're creatures of habit. Once something feels good once, it starts to feel good over and over and over again. And then you just continue doing it until it consumes you. In December 2008, I got to the lowest point of my life. I, I saw no way out. I took my 9 millimeter and I put it in my mouth. I was done. I don't want to live. This is the life I said I would not live. I cursed God every day for what he did to me. I blamed him for everything that was going on. 
If you are God, where are you in my life? Where? I don't see it. I don't see a way out. I'm losing everything because of why? Because you want me to be a certain way or I'm supposed to believe a certain thing or I'm supposed to go a certain way? I want to do what I want to do. Who are you to tell me what I need to do? So I wanted to end it. I saw no other way. But just then, just then, an unexpected phone call stops me from squeezing one off. My dad, who I never talked to ever, in three years calls me randomly on Christmas Eve of 2008. Hey, son, what are you doing? I'm crying. I'm drunk. I'm all over the place. And all I could tell him was, I don't want to live. And that's all I could tell him. And he's like, you know what? Call me back in five minutes and hangs up on me. Are you sick? What the? He knows me. He knows my little OCD. You know, I'm like, oh, no, he did not. You know, because at this point, I'm in the military just like him. So he's kind of one of the ones that I look up to. So I call him back. I explain everything to him. He says, man, this is what you got to do. You got to go get some help. You got to do this. You, gotta do this. you think he told me to turn to Christ? Nope. My dad doesn't believe in that stuff. But he did tell me to go to the chaplain. So I went to the chaplain. The chaplain on a base gave me a couple scriptures to read. Okay, Jeremiah 29 11. Huh. Well, if Jeremiah 29 11 says that, for I know the plans I have for you, does he plan on me being an alcoholic? Was that one of his plans for me? The chaplain says, maybe. Okay. What about 1 John 4? 1 John 4, he is greater in you than he who is in the world. He's not in me. I don't even, I mean, I don't feel him. Is he there? I don't. Chaplain's like, maybe. So he gave me some scripture to read. And I went to the alcohol dependency program on base called ADAPT, Alcohol and Drug Dependency and Prevention and Treatment. I was there for a couple months. And then my commander saw a big turnaround in my life because I said, I've got to get better. I cannot stay here. And I started to read scripture a little bit. And as I read more, I felt that type of change that I wanted. A couple months later, my commander says, man, you got a powerful testimony. You're not drinking. You are helping other people in your same situation. You should go be a drill instructor. I'm like, a drill instructor? For what? He's like, you need to be a drill instructor. You have a powerful testimony. Okay, I'll go do that. I put in an application, and lo and behold, I'm a drill instructor. I was a drill instructor for Air Force Basic Training from 2009 to 2013. During that time, I saved three young men from suicide. I now understood why God put me in that dark place because I felt what they felt. I understood where those young men were coming from. In basic training, they were drinking, but they were away from home. They're 19. Maybe a girlfriend broke up with them, and they missed their family, and they're not ready. That is a melting pot for young men in basic training to kill themselves. So after my basic training time, I went and I got stationed here in North Carolina. I met a guy named Richard Lambert who is on base. He's our community support coordinator. And he saw me and says, dude, you were a drill instructor. I've got a job for you. And I was to the point where I was like, man, my, my oh, man, I, I can't even say enough about my wife. My wife is so amazing. She put up with me through this whole ordeal. I'm talking 0400 in the morning till 2100 at night, Sunday to Sunday for four years. That's how I was at work. Get a couple weeks off in between flights, but she stuck it out. Oh, we wanted to separate a couple times, but she stuck it out because I'm the bomb. So anyway, <laughs> she told me, she goes, you need to do this. Like, this is, like, you have to do this. So I went to school to be a master resiliency trainer. I teach mental, physical, spiritual, and social resilience skill sets. That's what I do. The biggest hurdle that we have is ourselves. Every negative thought that we have is self-created because God doesn't put negative thoughts in our hearts. Every negative thought that we have is self-created. Every place that we put ourselves negative-wise is created by our own decisions. There's a handbook. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, the, the Bible. There's a handbook for life. I didn't even know this. I was like, there's a handbook that tells you, oh, okay, that's is, it, is there one for debt, too? And they're like, yeah, there's one for debt, too. I'm like, yes, because I love me some debt. So anyway, 
I'm sitting here teaching mental, physical, spiritual, social relationships, and then I turn around and said, hmm, there's something to this. I'm applying these principles, but I feel like there's something missing. There's definitely something missing in here. So I deploy. My wife and I, literally five years, no birth control, no pregnancy. Couldn't figure out why. What is going on? Right before my deployment, she gets pregnant. I think I lucked out because I didn't have to go get ice cream and pickles at 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm just saying. So she, the woman that she is, for seven months, whoop, for seven months, dealt with a pregnancy on her own. Some friends came by, but dealt with it on her own. I could only be a phone call or a video chat away. We come back, the baby's born. A couple months later, she says, hey, you know, I've been going to this church while you're deployed. I'm like, oh, <laughs> nice try. I see what you did there. Nice try. Not going to happen. So she's going to church by herself. And then I decide, okay, I'll go. That's fine. I'll go. You did all that for me. You ran the guilt trip. Nice try. Got it. I'll just go. So I started going to church. And in about a month, a literal transformation came over my life. I'm the TV watcher during dinner. I'm on the phone. I'm doing all this other stuff. Now, there are no phones at my table. All the TVs are shut off, and we pray before every single meal. There is no way that God is not a part of our life. No way. There was a literal transformation when I let him in, and I said, you know what, God? It's on you. I, I can't do this anymore. It's on you. I was fighting against something that I didn't really know that I needed. And that's some of the problem. You never know what you need until you find it. Every tragedy that we go through births a passion and purpose. If I wouldn't have become an alcoholic, if I wouldn't have tried to take my own life, if I wouldn't have become a drill instructor, I would not be on this stage today. If I wouldn't have did what I did and had my wife start just miraculously going to church, here she is getting baptized. My wife decided she needed to be baptized. And I was baptized as a kid. You know, my, my parents were raised Catholic, and my grandparents, and we were raised Catholic. And all, but there wasn't a relationship with Jesus like there should be. It was a, you have to go to church because I tell you to. Got it. My life is 100,000% different. That's me as a drill instructor. That's us at the beach. That's Mackenzie before and after. <laughs> That's the life we live now, Christ-centered. If he is not the center of your life, there is something missing. Without him, I would not be who I am today. And I guarantee you, and this holds true so many times, no matter how you look at it, God will put people in your path for a reason, for a season, for a moment of time. There are two gentlemen here today. They are the reason I'm up here. It was a pipe dream for me to be a speaker me to be an author. I prayed about it. Is this really what you want me to do? I just, I don't, I don't know if that's really what I want. They said, go for it. If God's telling you to do it, do it. I've got a book about my transformation when I came to Christ. I'm a speaker. I'm living the dream. My dream life is right here. I will be on the TED stage in the next five years. The bridge church right there, that's our church. I will have a pier that looks just like that with a rocking chair. That will be my house. I will have a boat. I want to be as big as Tony Robbins. I don't, I don't, I don't want to be famous. I don't want to be famous. That's not what I want. I want to be as big as Tony Robbins. When Tony Robbins walks into a room, you're like, oh. When, people, when I walk into a room, people are like, I need what he has. I need his passion. I need his fire. I need in my life. That's what I need. He gave me the power to do what I do, and he put people in my path to help me. Birth, passion through tragedy. Everything you go through is preparing you for where you're going. God does not care where you've been. He only cares where you're going. That's all he cares about. We're supposed to go out and make disciples of Christ. I try to do that every day. I tell my kids, I tell family, hey, man, you want to go to church with us? Hey, man, you want to? 
every day, every chance I get, because he transformed me into the person I am today with the help of the followers like you.